all come the theater and to tonight's lecture. My name is Ann Peterson. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. And on behalf of the staff and the board of directors of the trust, I'd like to congratulate the Santa Barbara School District on 150 years of service to the Santa Barbara community. We are so pleased to have you all here to commemorate this really special anniversary for the district. Tonight's presentation is taking place on the campus for the Santa Barbara School of the Arts. The theater that you're in, the Alatama, was built in 1925 for the drama, music, and dance classes for the School of the Arts. The mural in the back, which I saw many of you admiring, was painted by American artist Ross Dickinson, whose work has been collected by the Smithsonian's Museum of American Art. Uh, we invite you to take a closer look uh, after the talk during our reception. We are pleased uh, tonight to have a special guest in the audience, our Mayor, Colleen Schneider, and you're going to be hearing more from her at the end of the talk. And um, I'm not seeing another a dignitary yet, so someone call out if they arrive a little bit late. Um, tonight's event is co-sponsored by our neighbors, the Santa Barbara Historical Museum, and their executive director, Lynn Brittner, is here tonight. You may have seen her um, out at their information table, and you'll see her again during the reception. Uh, she's brought a wonderful slideshow of uh, early photos of schools in Santa Barbara. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy that. Uh, we're also, of course, very pleased to be co-sponsoring this with the Santa Barbara Unified School District and uh, grateful to the efforts of Barbara Kiani, who really made this uh, program happen tonight. And I met with Barbara like a year and a half ago, and she was at the early stages of planning for uh, this whole season of events, and it's so fun to be a part of uh, everything coming to fruition. After the presentation, we hope that you'll join us for a cupcake and a champagne toast outside in our beautiful plaza. And uh, to introduce our talks, uh, education unites communities and prepares them for the future. We can see on the news what happens to societies without formal education that is available to everyone. So on this date in 1866, when the people of Santa Barbara created the school district, they made a commitment to us today. They set into motion a structure and a belief system that brought people together regardless of their countries of origin. We owe them thanks for their vision and their willingness to create this enduring institution. Tonight's program is in, in honor of their commitment. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our two distinguished uh, leaders of education from our community who are going to speak to us tonight. Their presentations will guide us through the past and the future of education. Our first speaker is Giorgio Parisinotto. Uh, he's recently retired from UC Santa Barbara after almost 40 years of teaching Spanish linguistics, history of the Spanish language, and Mexican culture. Um, and his retirement, although a loss to UCSB, is a real gain to the Trust for Historic Preservation because he's been able to return to our research center committee on which I serve. Born in Italy, he came to the United States as a young man and attended Syracuse University uh, for his BA and Columbia for his MA and his doctorate. He also studied at El Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City as a recipient of an Organization of American States Dissertation Fellowship. His interest in documenting and studying the Hispanic past in Santa Barbara goes back many years and has resulted in several publications. And his special interest in the beginning of education in California was spurred by his work in Mexico, where he worked for the Secretary of Education in the Language Program in Oaxaca. A former board member and vice president of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation, he is currently a member of the Research Center Committee. Our second speaker, uh, Mr. Cash, is um, going to discuss the present and the future of education in Santa Barbara. Uh, he is the current superintendent for the Santa Barbara Unified School District, although uh, we learned that he plans to retire next week, um, which I'll be aware of that. Uh, David Cash received his BA in Cultural Anthropology from UCSB, followed by a JD from Willamette University, an MA in Educational Leadership, uh, before returning to receive an education doctorate from USC. His commitment to the Santa Barbara community has been honored with such awards as Principal of the Year in 1996, Galita's Finest Educator of the Year in 2002, 
and the Santa Barbara County Crystal Apple Administrator of the Year in 1994 and 2004. He's been the superintendent of several school districts in Southern California, fueled by his mantra, every child, every chance, every day. <coughs> He's helped to improve student achievement in his districts while fostering an educational culture that values diverse opportunities for students to thrive. So please help me welcome both of our speakers, and we'll call up um, Professor Parisinoto to the stage first. How's uh, my voice? Does it carry okay? Yeah. All right. I have tendency, my voice has tendency to fade, so please let me know if, uh, if, if it does. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about education on this, on this wonderful occasion. Uh, let me just start with a, a quote, and I would invite you to try to guess what this quote is about, when it was uh, written or, or, or uttered, uh, but I will tell you at the end. I quote, Know that on the right hand from the Indies exists an island called California, very close to a side of earthly paradise. And it was populated by black women without <coughs> any man existing there because they lived in the way of the Amazons. They had beautiful and robust bodies and were brave and very strong. Their island was the strongest of the world with its cliffs and rocky shores. Their weapons were golden and so were the harnesses of the wild beasts that they were accustomed to taming so they could be ridden, because there was no other metal in the island than gold. Now, I'm not going to test you, is it? Well, this was actually written in 1510 by Garcia de Montalvo, uh, and that's where the name California comes from, in spite of the very different other proposal. But Garcia Montalvo um, was never in California. This is 1510. <laughs> I had no idea, but of course this is part of the origin. But it was right. It was right about a beautiful place and being on the right side of paradise. It was not so right about being an island, of course. But anyway, so I just want to frame this. Now it is customary for academics to uh, document their sources via footnotes. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. However, I do assure you that if you're really interested you want to challenge me, there are footnotes at the end of the paper. But this is not meant for publication yet. Uh, I owe a lot to the Trust for Historic Preservation for having uh, opened their archive, their door, the archives, and staff to my research uh, spanning several years, as, as I was already uh, pointed out. I also owe much to the uh, Santa Barbara Historical Society and to Michael Beckman in particular for giving me access to their holdings. Um, the short map of the, uh, I have to figure out this one. I thought I turned it, oh, there it is. Uh, so in, in order to frame this a little better, I have, uh, you know, I have put up some historical uh, framework of uh, of public education, and some of it, I'm not going to go through all of them, but this particular one may be, may be interesting, uh, you know, you can read it yourself, uh, but let's center on Thomas Jefferson proposed a two-track educational system with different tracks in his words for the laboring and the learning. Scholarship will allow very few of the laboring class to advance, and Jefferson says, by raking a few geniuses from the rubbish. Pretty strong. I don't think I need to comment on that, uh, but it is uh, uh, quite, quite, quite striking. So let me go forward. Um, 1785. Um, this is not what I'm going to read. Really. The Continental Congress, before the uh, passing the Constitution, said that the law created townships reserving a portion of each township for local school. From these land grants, uh, so that's where we have the uh, system of land grants universities. In order to uh, create these townships, the Continental Congress assumed it had the right to give away and sell lands already occupied by native people. Again, the comment would be superfluous. Uh, I'm going to skip.
skip ahead uh, in terms of education is concerned. And let me just point to this one now. In 1846, uh, the uh, invasion of Mexico is over. And in 1848, these are all dates that are very well known to you. Um, uh, the war against Mexico ends with the signing of the Treaty Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gives the United States almost half of what was then Mexico. This is included in those numbers. Southwest, Utah, Nevada, Wyoming, and most of California. Now, here's the interesting part. The treaty guarantees citizenship right to everyone living in these areas, mostly Mexico's and native people. It also guarantees the continued use of the Spanish language, including in, edu including in education. 150 years later, California breaks the treaty by passing propositions. These are not my words. Uh, which would make it illegal to teach to preach Spanish in the public school. That is a rather strong statement. Uh, but anyway, so here it is. I am conversant with that. Uh, but uh, if actually the treaty, I would, uh, would, uh, uh, would invite you to read it. It's very, very interesting in its, uh, in its, uh, in its articles. Um, I think there should be more dissertation uh, written on it. But the point here to be made is that it might be useful to look back and realize that education in the Western regions is hardly mentioned in the history of education. And because it was in the hands of Spain from, uh, from 1769, but people think that the Spaniards have always been here, but they weren't. Uh, from 1769 to 1821, which is independence from, from Spain and from Mexico, and from Mexico until late, from 1848, and then, of course, the United States. Now, uh, so let me try to uncover this, this foggy period <coughs> leading up to the signal year of 1856, of which I will speak briefly. And, and this is again, uh, uh, indirectly and indirectly, uh, a recognition of the work uh, of, of uh, researchers who in 1963 uh, fulfilled the requirements for a master's degree at the University of California with a thesis titled, A Study of the Historic Development of the Santa Barbara School District subsequently summarized in the journal Noticia, and uh, it's in your website, and, and Barbara just <laughs> offered me one, but I read it in the entire, it's a superb case of the understanding, I didn't know that the writer, the author is still alive, and it's, uh, it's a great, I mean, I, maybe we didn't have a doctorate in those days in education, but it's really, since I think I know a little bit about doctorates, uh, it, it's really very, 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 very substantial pieces and go to the website and read it. It's quite interesting. Uh, okay, uh, so I, write, I break my own rules. I do do citations. Uh, the thesis chronicles the hard and rocky start of the school in Santa Barbara from the first teacher who was recruited from a passing ship only to go back to it as a, as a ship boy, grumete in Spanish, two years later. Uh, it's I repeat, it's a quite good and it's a very good thing that it is on your website and again. But in sharp contrast to the judicious analysis by Christian, I'm sorry, did you say his name? Robert M. Christian is this a gentleman's name. I understand he lives in a Tascadero or someplace. Uh, in contrast to this, we have a statement in 1906 by the Chamber of Commerce that reads in part. In a quote, the character of any community is exactly measured by the quality of its schools. Thoroughly, thoroughly awake to the importance of having the best of all things, Santa Barbara has taken hold of her school problems, I underscore problems, with a vigor and breadth of view that is rapidly advancing the system to a foremost among <coughs> leaders, east or west. This is 1906. Again, pointing to the problems. The formal schooling between the founding of the Presidio in 1782 and the Chamber's depiction of 1906 has certainly been a path of improvement of excellence, no question about that. The 1906 wording of the Chamber of Commerce is an echo of the many times repeated statement that California of the Spanish and Mexican periods cared little about formal education. And in 1834, there were only three primary schools open in Alta California. Against such a background, it is important to note the documentation until recently has been scant and not primary, much of it coming from short-lived serial publications and book of limited distribution. And those that work, we know what that means.
means. Um, just what it says. The wanting scholarship regarding age education is almost invariably stated that until statehood in the 1950s, statehood of California, nothing was happened yet. In 1844, decree by Mexican governor of California, Manuel Michel Torena, in that, city is named after, uh, made education obligatory for children over the age of six, with provision to exclude those who could be tutored privately or were needed at home. And even earlier, remember the dates that framed this presentation, Governor Pablo Vicente Solá, the last Spanish governor in office between 1815 and 1821, opened the so just before the independence of Mexico, opened a school in Monterrey for boys and girls, soon followed by others. In 1828, a Roman in the public schools in Los Angeles stood at 61. And the data here is not so dependable. In, 88, in 1841, we had the first, the essentially first census shows a population, a school population of 141. This, you can look it up in the California Almanac. And the first U.S. census showed the population of 16, of or 1600 or so. Narrowing my focus now on the schooling in Santa Barbara, again, the reports are scarce, scattered, confusing, and at times contradictory. I will attempt to mark the beginning of formal education in California and trace its development to the middle of the 19th century. And I tend to glean for, from uh, documentary sources. It would follow that uh, the same pattern would be found in other procedures, and that is true. Now, that the education in Spanish-American colonies was an explicit wish of the Spanish kings in the various edicts, this is, can, hard, you know, can hardly be disputed. Uh, and that the educational materials and aids, as well as provision for hiring of teachers, date back to the 16th century. It's well known that the, the, uh, the history of, of uh, education in America is very, very well known. It is also true, of course, that there were formidable barriers to the implementation of a formal educational system in territories where the need for literacy this is important, the need for literacy and written communication were hard to justify in view of the isolation of the territories and the, and the difficulty of reaching. And of course, the demands of, uh, for labor of every member of the family, including children. The soldiers in the family were mostly illiterate, with only a few officers being able to read and write. As a matter of fact, a soldier, in order to be promoted beyond corporal, had to prove that he could read and write. The padres of the mission did instruct the neophytes in the Catholic faith and did so through informal instruction in literacy with well documented and signal successes with the young Luisenio man, with the, most people know him by the name of Pablo Tac, but I will skip over that part. Now, several years ago, the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation made, public, made a possible the publication of, uh, uh, of, of, of a set of documents uh, that were obtained uh, in Spanish archives and Mexican archives in, in a book that is called uh, Documenting Everyday Life in Early Spanish California, the Santa Barbara Presidio Memorias y Facturas. I guess you can guess who did that, <laughs> together with my graduate students and staff uh, from, from the Presidio, from the Trust. So, so this, this collection of documents complements, confirms, and at times a real aspect of the daily lives of the soldiers and their families. So, so in addition to the uniforms, what, what, did they, what clothes did they wear? Shoes, stockings, scarves? What did they drink? Well, of course, you know, wine and agua viento. And all this is documented. Which staple food did they, did they need and even crave? Chocolate is ordered in abundance. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were right on that one. Um, but of course, you have to have sugar. You know, the coffee is very popular. Well. But which tools did they need to build and maintain the newly built structures? <laughs> and for the purpose of the talk, did they ask for and receive educational material <coughs> such as pens and paper, as well as books, which would point to the existence of schools? And that is what I will talk about. We know that in 1795, so a decade after the founding, more or less, a 
California governor Diego de Borica asked one peso of each town resident for the establishment of the, of the school. Now this is document, you know, this is not something. Well, I, I don't to just, I, I don't make things up. Uh, so the tax, the school tax, for one peso. Um, Commandante Felipe de Gorgochea, in command of the Presidio from 1784 to 1902, he did the request and hired a teacher. Uh, from 17, well, the name of Joseph Toca, who nevertheless was fired after repeated charges of incompetence. <laughs> Another teacher was, uh, was hired, supposedly better trained, with acceptable penmanship. The penmanship was highly criticized. Uh, I hate to say that I would probably not be hired you know, if, they, if they tested my penmanship. But let me transition to the materials not available to previous researchers. In general, original documents, and I remember, I could have just, you know, photocopied the document and said what I decided to do is show you the, the original Spanish transcribed into a video form. <coughs> Also, so these are transcription of the original document. This is number, uh, document number four, and signed by Joseph Francisco. Okay, the first commandant. This, so it says, one blank book with 400 sheets. I will have that uh, translation in most other. These are uh, 100 primers, uh, 20 Christian readers, and 20 catechisms. Okay, and let's see, I think it's page. Yeah, no, that's right there. Now. If you reflect on this, the petition of papers is not necessarily being school use, but the request for children, primers, and cartones certainly does. They suggest instruction. Lest this order for paper and instructional material be considered insignificant in an isolated request, it must be pointed out the inventory of petitions for goods of the, of the presidios and other sites, such orders abound. Catones Cristianos are requested, or Christian readers, are requested in six documents and catechisms in five. Let us also keep in mind that although we are examining only a few uh, documents, uh, the, if we forget, and I did the, the, the written clip, it adds to well over 200, so obviously more than uh, administrative use. Um, now, Catones, those of you that are really so inclined, it's some of Interesting history. This actually named after Cato, the elder, you know, in the second century A.D. So, and then that people, but they call Christians, that which shows that the people, even in Spain, who did it, didn't realize that maybe he, Cato himself, was not. Uh, well, he was a prophet. We don't know whether he was actually a Christian or not. Okay. Now, let's see. I'm supposed to go to. Um, yeah. <coughs> The, the cartilla that was mentioned before as an, as an instructional tool was instituted during the reigns of Catholic kings, Ferdinand of Aragon, uh, and, uh, and Isabel of Castile. It was used uh, all the way into the 19th century. Uh, and the cartilla refers, uh, and the Caton Cristiano, but see what I want to point out here. You see, it's a para uso de las escuelas. This is for school use. So, you know, you can't argue that this, this was for school. This was a textbook, as it were. Um, let me see if I can. Um, I don't have the number here, so. Uh, okay, but the cartilla designation referred more to the format. And if you had a big sheet of paper and you doubled it up, and uh, usually you had 60 pages. And the first four pages contain the alphabet, the lower and upper case script. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. Okay, so this is the, this is the true cartilla of Silabari. So what you see again, you know, what it says, para uso de las escuelas. This is 18, now, watch this, this is 1810. And purposely, I, I got it from, this is, uh, if it's, oh, but it's from Argentina. But the story of the, Publishing of these cartillas is it's another conference, but they, because they printed them all over the place. So, so this is 1810, 
And you can see there was a study of, uh, of uh, this is a school textbook. I think it's okay. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, National School for the Teachers uh, in, uh, in Argentina, but it was used uh, so what would can we assume that the basic educational tools requested and available to the perceived children were blank books or sheets of paper, <coughs> primers, catechisms, pens, nibs, and ink. We'll get to the nibs and ink. The paper was ordered in very uh, types and quality. Common paper, cut paper, cut for letters. In Spanish there are uh, Papel común, papel corriente, sin cortar, fino, cortado, and so on and so on and so forth. Papel florete, recortado para cartas, superior, all kinds of paper. Uh, and it was ordered usually in resmas, uh, which means uh, reams in Spanish. Very specific number of sheets, but again, I will not do that. Um, now, let's see if I can do that. Oops. Before that, uh, I'll get to it. Uh, oh, that we specifically know that this was para niños, rivers for children. So this, because remember, cartillas may have been also instructional manuals, but the fact that it's specific, they say para niños for children, we know that they were for schools. Okay. Uh, in a 1790 document, Goicochea, who by the way is so bad, such a bad sounding name, but he was born in northern Mexico, by the way. So he orders, uh, I'm going to read it in Spanish first, dos libras de tinta en polvo, two pounds of powder ink. Now that's important. And two dozens of uh, dos docenas de pluma para escribir. Two dozen writing pens. Okay, so, so here it is. Uh, a year later, the order for ink and pens is renewed, adding two dozens of quill pens from Castile. Now, sure, you know, the, 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 the ink and the pens were also used for ministry, but the sheer number of these and, and put it into context of the other uh, document that I showed you. Um, I think they're, they're quite significant. Um, it's interesting, so let me move to the next one. Okay, now this is a, quite an interesting uh, uh, instruction of how to use a pen. Uh, notice, and so number one is, so number one is here, this is how to hold the pen. Number two, postula del brazo, and we'll give you how the owner is to be place number three uh, the elbow uh, must uh, protrude uh, from the desk two de those dedos, two fingers it's not, you know, being left-handed and being taught in in, in, uh, in Europe when I was and I remember I still hear the voice of my teacher you know when I tried to write with my left hand he said hey she not done and I just automatically stuck my hand out so that I could be right <laughs> And I guess what, I'm very left-handed, but I had to learn it right in my mind. So, so this, is, uh, this, this is quite interesting. And uh, the, the, the trust, I think, receives a, a substantial number of, of kids in the third grade. And they <coughs> come into a room and get recreated based on that. And uh, I'm not sure that everybody loves it because they really make a mess. <laughs> but they love it. You have to do it with good pens, so we have supplies to supply them. You supply them with crew pens, but I, I think it's again a testimony to this type of, of research. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna. Uh, if you're interested in, in primers, I could tell you a little more about it, uh, but let me see if I can go on to um, the, the, the different nibs. <laughs> they're, they're very different it's, it's according to the, uh, to the type of uh, the type of holding a pen. This from 1823. Uh, uh, very, very specific of, of, of what. Uh, I said briefly about the Christian readers. Now, the, see, let me go to another one. Oops. Um, okay, yeah. So 
So if you look at this document, Cajun of Horses, oh, okay. Uh, what the name of the Cartier, what the name of this, more or less adds up to a ring, a resma, of primers, uh, four dozens of Christian readers, but here's what I want to say. The cuatro docenas de cartillas digo catecismo de padre y padre. Okay, this is an interesting thing, particularly if you're a linguist or you like it, so why would they say that? Uh, well, because uh, there were no backspacing and strike through in those days, so whenever they made a mistake, rather than crossing it out, they just kept writing and said digo. That means what I mean is catechism of padre y padre. So, now, any Hispanic you mentioned Padre de Padre, we know what we're talking about because it's still used. I'm sure that my wife recognizes the name Padre de Padre. It's still used. It was still used until very, very few years ago, and we're not that old. <laughs> so it, it, it is absolutely it is used. The interesting thing is that the Padre de Padre was actually born in the 16th century, <laughs> and uh, he died in 1621 or something like that. He never saw but a tremendous uh, longevity, and there are millions and millions of those uh, still. I'm going to just see if I find another one. Okay. No, this is. Oh, no, don't, don't look at that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not totally ignoring what this is. Yeah, I'm not totally ignoring All right. <laughs> um, there is one. I should, I should, did, I, did I mess up there? I'm going to go to the screen. Well, the in my big fingers. Uh, well, let me just read it to you. Vinti Catones Cristianos, four catechism, and a hundred cartillas para niñas. So, a hundred primers for girls. One hundred. So, uh, what can we make of that? Well, for one thing, we have to uh, deduct that the, the Christian readers and the catechisms were not the same. So they, were, they had two different purposes. So added to the books that were available, requested, and received, because the document I'm talking about, there were request orders and receipts for what they got. And the Hanagatilla Paraninas raises the question, was, were there different texts for real different from boys? I have to be careful here because I don't know. Because, uh, you know, I have not seen them. Uh, maybe what it means is that the, the 100 Paraninas testify that it's a testament to the presence of children in school, to women, for girls in school, as early as this, this is 1793. So they were specifically, maybe it just speaks to the number and not necessarily to the content. But again, it's those of us that have done this, you know, one, one dis discovery or uncovering generates another quest and another quest and another quest and you never finish. Okay, so I am, um, I am uh, heading back. Uh, whoops, did that go by itself? That's, that's <laughs> Oh, there, there it goes. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I, I am heading towards the resolution here. Um, so, what I would say that the available documentation points to the existence of the, of the nascent educational system with an active permanent teacher at times, the availability of printed textbooks serving a dual purpose of religious instruction and the teaching of reading and writing. Writing implements, including powder ink and glue pens. The language of instruction was, it was going to be for over half a century Spanish. The religion was Catholicism. The code of conduct was that of a good Christian. Before I conclude, I would like to link these remote times with the occasion that bring us here. And now we can say, so that we, have talk, that we can talk about centuries of public education in Santa Barbara rather than very recent past, and I think that I hope I made my point. And as a bridge to my conclusion, let me read a portion of the letter. I hope you get, I kind of get it now. Yes. Um, a portion of uh, a letter from a teacher in the public schools of the 
to the superintendent of the Board of Commission. Please know the civility of the language, and the date is 1856. And for me to here to stay for your information that I've been teaching the school for nearly a year past at a salary of only 75 per month. I now respectfully and earnestly appeal to your honorable board, hoping you will be kind, kindly pleased to increase my salary, and thereby give us a new impetus in the discharge of the boys' duties. I have the honor to be, gentlemen, your most respectful people in Conway, teacher of the public school of city center, 1856. That's pretty good. I mean, I, I think he would sign that, Mr. Nash, he would sign that right now, right? I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so um, the last slide is a, a testament to go even further. This is from the Codex from the very, very, very early 16th century in Mexico. It's very well known. Uh, and what it is, this is a school. This is a teacher, a Mexica. You're not supposed to say Aztec. I'll tell you that later. Uh, a Mexica. Uh, that is, of course, the teaching that is teaching, and those little uh, glyphs are actually, you know, that's language. And so, so this is the beginning uh, of education. So, conclusion. Given the centuries-old Spanish policy of instituting a formal educational system, which was continued after the independence of Mexico from Spain, and flourished, flourished after the annexation of the, uh, to the United States, one can conclude that the scarcity of documentation is not a sufficient argument for dismissing and devaluing the educational system in California since the early settlement. What I'm proposing here is a continuation and a change and an improvement. No question about that. But not, not it comes from nothing. To the lore of California as the last frontier, almost always depicted as fine time and spirit from the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. I would propose that we consider this region as the recipient of the same intellectual forces that swept Europe and Latin America. However diluted and sporadically applied, we should not set aside as incidental the implementation of policy, which, like education, were grounded in the tenets of the age of reason. Even though the pueblos of mission were the battlegrounds where religious, civil, and royal authority met and confronted one another, these very conflicts attest and echo the events which would transform Europe and the colonial powers. The last thing, the children and also the adults who attended the schools, read the primers, and practiced the penmanship, who were born Spanish, lived as Mexican, and died as Americans, all in one lifetime, for many of them. Thank you very much.
And some of these ideas that we've already begun will really need to take hold in the near future. First and foremost, we must be a culturally proficient school district. We must be a place that reflects the community where we work and live. We must place a value where every student is respected, every family valued, and where every employee understands that they make a substantive difference in the lives of the children in their classrooms. Perhaps one of the most difficult changes involves the recognition that classroom teachers no longer simply deliver the content. Recognizing that the content of schooling is ubiquitous, <coughs> it's everywhere, and also recognizing that our students know that now. In fact, they know it better than most of us. This 21st century reality of schooling has resulted in the beginning of numerous changes in the Santa Barbara Unified School District that must continue and expand. We have now recognized that the restriction of learning by time and location is not as important as it once was. The idea that students' learning is determined by a static block of time in a specific location. And in Santa Barbara, we're at the beginning in our development of online courses where students will learn on their own time or in a virtual classroom. We now know that teachers are understanding that their job is to help students acquire skills. Not what my generation would call those soft skills, but actually important skills of listening, collaborating, thinking critically, thinking divergently, and communicating and sharing what they know with other people. Students are learning about having job-embedded learning, where content is everywhere. Students demand relevance to their time, and so learning needs to take place in more relevant contexts. And that's evident by the explosion of programs of choice in our district and our career technical education pathways. The advance of social media in education, who you follow on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram, is becoming, or has become, depending on what generation you're in, a huge source of legitimate news information and learning for children currently in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. And blogs and wikis have become a primary source of information for students in the 21st century. Now, none of what I just said is earth-shattering or even <laughs> moderately incendiary for the students in our classrooms and our schools right now. However, to be very frank, for the adults in the system, what I have described before is a huge change in thinking, a change in how we approach our work, and a change in our day-to-day -day reality in schools and in classrooms. And so as a result, that change is very slow. If, it's up to the, if it was up to the students, what I'm about to describe as a possible future would already be happening. What the students want and what they need is surprisingly very similar, and that's good for us adults. They want and they need to know how to work with people different than themselves. They want and need to know how to read, to write, to listen, and to speak. They want and need to know how to learn in an information economy where content is everywhere. They want and need access to networks. The idea of a professional learning community for students is a no-brainer. They want the adults to model the idea that learning is a lifelong activity, that the thirst for understanding, with an understanding that change is the only constant, is what our students need to see in the adults they work with each and every day. And they want and they need information on a world that has become increasingly smaller and smaller. So what will public education look like 150 years from now? Interestingly, the best idea would be, best answer would be, I have no idea. Also, interestingly, 150 years ago, one would have hoped that education would be very different than it is today. Sadly, not enough has changed over the past 150 years. And knowing that there must be significant changes over the next 150 years, it's with great trepidation that I offer these ideas about the future. Education will be totally global and not focused on local needs. We will have global learning platforms that will serve millions of people across the world in acquiring new knowledge and skills in professional and personal development. 
And some of these platforms will be online universities, while others will be integrated into popular social networks and, believe it or not, I think, online gaming universes. Learning processes will be dynamically adapted to students' personal needs, their learning styles and abilities, and even their current mind and body condition. Students will be able to learn individually and in teams, obtaining access to world-class teachers and experts. Teachers and trainers, note that word, trainers, in their turn will be able to build their audience with learners from, very, with, with, from regions from all across the world, leaving behind the limitations that have been set upon them by academic institutions. These global learning platforms will include ideas like teachers, will be hired based upon the development of their teacher reputation model, not just based on passing a test or sitting through classes and earning a degree, because students are going to need multidisciplinary experts that can guide professional and personal development for those students. Teaching will be evidence-based. The pedagogy will be evidence-based. It will adapt to the learner's needs and abilities as they learn. We'll have simulations of real-life activities where the training of complex skills takes place, including the training in management, engineering design, and engineering skills. And like I said earlier, I really believe we will have game universities. There will be a direct integration of educational experiences into the gaming process. All of this means we'll be focused on personal learning, entirely focused on personalized learning. Personalized learning trajectories will support individual learners from early childhood, zero to four, all the way up to when they can no longer learn. These trajectories will integrate formal and informal education and career, volunteering and hobbies, leisure, entertainment, and community life. Personalized education, I believe, will be guided by role models and knowledgeable mentors who will inspire people to gain new competencies, conduct new projects, create new art, design new things, and build objects we can't even dream of. Personal tra trajectories will also connect people with communities where they work, where they learn, socialize, and entertain themselves. I also believe financial institutions will learn to support personalized learning because it will open up new types of investment, such as direct talent investment and educational insurance. I also think students will have a digital competence portfolio where they will have a record of the skills and knowledge that has been confirmed by trainers, supervisors, and their peers. We are not going to be able to stay isolated in Santa Barbara. And as urban environments across the world grow into connected, human-friendly communities where learning, socializing, working, and playing becomes intertwined activities, with the support of mobile technology, we'll also have things like robotics and something I don't know anything about but my daughter told me I needed to say, the Internet of Things. So hopefully someone out there knows what that is. <laughs> Local governments will also have to change and be part of education. It will help people learn and help people share with their neighborhood communities. People will be involved in long games where daily routines will be combined with role-playing and educational tasks. They will exchange their skills ranging from cooking to yoga to time management and will work together to make their cities better through various types of do-it-yourself community gardens, this is another one from my 11-year-old, fab labs and bio-neuro-hack labs and more. Urban learners will get support from family universities, another place where we'll educate. They'll collectively learn how to care better about themselves, for people as they age, for children after they're born, and their relatives and their peers. Citizen governments will also have to change. Local politics and interactions within communities will become ground for knowledge and skill sharing as opposed to division and conflict. I also think we're going to have a lot more DIY networks, one of my favorite shows on TV, where collaborative learning that exchange essential skills within communities, from cooking to repairing, will be commonplace. 
We are going to obviously be moving into a knowledge-based economy, and it will have to make everyone a knowledge worker in that economy. Our knowledge-based economy, I think, will expand rapidly through digitalization. That will, and I think our preference for digitalization will continue to grow. I just always think about what's in my pocket and probably in most everyone else's pocket in this room. 25 years ago, no one could have imagined that something would be as powerful as this that could reside in my pocket and cost less than $500. I think we'll continue to grow in form of simulations. There'll be virtual labs. And knowledge will be derived from huge, huge archives of data that we'll have access to. I also believe that artificial intelligence will become a significant component in education in the future. And we'll, quite frankly, need a high level of artificial intelligence. And I think we see some of that now in cloud-based computing. I think artificial intelligence will become indispensable collaborators, collaborators with our communities. We'll store organized knowledge as it's being created. And I think really cool what will happen is a, or artificial intelligence will help us transfer that information as it's happening into live textbooks and learning materials for students wherever they are and whatever they need to learn. Woo! Oh boy. That's a very different world than 18... 66 and clearly very different than 2016. I would just conclude by saying I hope that the world is very different in 2166, 150 years from now, than it is in 2016. And I would end by saying the best news about Santa Barbara is this is a community that cares deeply about education. It has a rich tradition of caring and compassion for youth and an understanding of how important education is for our future. But that framework in this community, I'm certain over the next 150 years, that we'll do an even better job than we've done this past 150 years. So again, I'd like to just say happy birthday, Santa Barbara Unified School District. It's been a great 150 years, and I'm very confident that the next 150 years will be even better. Um, in providing excellent service to our community. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Snyder. Wow. Um, I, uh... Okay. Well, you only turned 150 once, right? So you might as well <laughs> celebrate and enjoy it. And after hearing Dr. Cash's uh, speech and thinking of the future, the, the thing that came to my mind was live long and prosper. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you think of uh, things that, that I want the holiday. I, that's what I want when we do, when we do city uh, appeals of, of buildings and things, is to get in the holiday and say, well, what if the third story was moved over here? And, you can, and we're, we're very close. We're very close to that. Uh, but I, I, it's an honor for me to be here as mayor representing the city on this auspicious occasion because throughout the 150 years and into the future, we still live in this place. And I think what that symbiotic relationship, that relationship between schools and municipal government, uh, you know, strong schools make for strong cities, for strong communities, and, and keeps us whole and keeps us vibrant and keeps us moving, keeps us learning. And the longer, and, and you know, not every city has the same kind of relationship with its school districts as I think this one does, um, in many different levels. And some cities, you know, it's the city government itself that oversees the school system. Thank goodness that's not part of it. <laughs> and, and I say that very, very honestly because, you know, I so value the board of trustees who are elected with one sole purpose, to educate our youth, and make them the best possible human beings they can be and to provide them with the tools that they can have so that we can, in the city, provide the community, including the youth, the structure, the infrastructure, the safety, the, the environment, so that you can thrive. And having that connection in two separate bodies, I think, make us stronger together. And so I really uh, appreciate the partnership that we have. 
I look forward to seeing it thrive in, into the, the new world that we're seeing. And, and, uh, um, and I think you're right that the 11 year olds of today are going to tell us how education is going to work for us tomorrow, and, and we're all better off for it. Um, so I don't know, Gail, if you're the official elected here, perhaps I can present this to you. Um, on behalf of the Santa Barbara City Council, we thank you for your contribution to the enhancement of Santa Barbara's educational system, for creating opportunities for our youth to be productive and to thrive. Education is the gateway to a brighter future for our children and community. The Santa Barbara Unified School District, 150th anniversary, June 6, 2016. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership and your partnership.